Geschichte. Today, we're excited to introduce our guest, Kevin Callahan, the dynamic CEO of Uniblock. Kevin, alumnus of Coinbase and Twitter, is known for his passion for building innovative uh, solutions and his fearless, uh, his fearless approach to tackling challenges head on. That's what he loves to do. Well, Uniblock is a Canada based company that recently secured a significant 2.3 million in funding thanks to the confidence of investors like Cadenza, Blockchain Founders, um, Side Door Ventures, AQN, Seraphon, Outsider Ventures, and others. And what this funding really means, it is a testament to the company's potential and the trust placed in uh, Kevin's leadership. So under Kevin's guidance, along with uh, the co other co-founders, James Liu and David Liu, Uniblock has become a one-stop platform offering a suite of tools for Web3 developers. Now, the company excels in providing backup, error management, and normalized data across various Web3 platforms. Uh, committed to fostering collaborations, uh, Uniblock works with industry leaders such as Alchemy, Third Web, Morales, uh, Parsec, and Quicknode, aiming to streamline integrations across diverse Web3 categories like DeFi, GameFi, NFTs, tokens, uh, security, on-ramp, uh, and off-ramps, and more. Uh, today, Kevin will share his insights on Uniblock's journey, its growth initiatives, and the future of blockchain technology. So sit back and get ready for an engaging conversation with one of the leading minds in the Web3 world. Kevin, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me, Arthur. Uh, so really good to have you here as well. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, it'd be great to just get started for the audience to give a little bit of background, sort of like um, about... A brief overview of Uniblock, maybe how the vision and idea transformed and how it all came together along with the mission uh, for this uh, serving this Web3 space. Absolutely. So uh, there had been a couple of different times where we were trying to build something in Web3 and even in Web2. And it became pretty clear that a lot of the tools that we take for granted in Web2 just aren't really there in Web3. And... You know, we spent a little bit of time, James, David, and I, thinking about why that was. And clearly, it isn't due to a lack of funding. You know, many, many companies have raised hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars to tackle this problem. And so when we started to really think deeply about it, it became uh, somewhat obvious to us that when you ask a founder what the analog for what they're building in Web3 is in Web2, particularly for dev tools, they invariably say something like, we're the Azure, we're the AWS, we're the GCP, we're the Firebase. And so they kind of want to be the everything tool. And I think we think there's two reasons why that is not necessarily applicable to Web3. I think we think the first thing is the breadth and depth of the space is so large. You know, there's different L1s and L2s and L3s, frankly, that we weren't talking about, you know, six months ago. There's different verticals that we weren't talking about, you know, even a couple of months ago. And so... We think that there's just too many things that need to be built because the surface area is so large. And that's great. But we also believe, you know, fundamentally that blockchain and Web3 and crypto is supposed to be decentralized. So there should be experts across all these different domains. Uh, that's, you know, why we started thinking about, okay, instead of building all these tools ourselves, how do we partner with the best tools, the people that are doing things like you said? So the best. RPC or the best data or the best on ramps, the best smart contracts. And so what we're doing is finding the best people, um, partnering with them and creating a platform so that, you know, all the different developers can have all those tools in one spot and make it a little bit easier. We're just thinking things a little bit differently. We don't want to compete with anybody. We want to partner with everybody. So it's just, a yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you think about, um, I guess if you will go way back when the internet kind of came about and all the different protocols, uh, communication layers that they were coming together and it, nothing was really formalized, right? And, uh, you know, at some point they had to kind of serve every single protocol um, to to deliver whatever it needs to on the in internet. Uh, nowadays, it, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of new builds coming out. Uh, like you said, a lot of L, L1s and L2s continue to go out. Some of them may survive, some of them won't. But the whole fact is uh, developers are building so fast and so quickly 
that a, like a tool like uh, Uniblock has helps pull things together and helps people move forward faster as well. I think it's it, it makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Uh, I guess um, going back to, I guess, the genesis of the whole bit, uh, maybe you can tell me a little bit about uh, how you met uh, uh, David, James, and, you know, how this came about. Was it through, like, a hackathon or anything like this <laughs> where you guys met? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, we met through friends. Uh, they were working on different projects. I was working on different projects. And we kind of, again, we met maybe about a year and a half, two years ago. And uh, to be honest, um, I have a very high bar for partnering with people in this regard, um, particularly in this space. You, you know, you want to make sure if you're putting your credibility on the line that you're doing it with a person that's, you know, equally, um, uh, you know, engaged in trying to do things the right way. So spent several months, frankly, dating. You know, we went and we played pool. We went for walks. We got ice cream. We did the YC, you know, founder dating exercise. And, um, yeah, I think that went really well. I think, um, for us, for me specifically, there was like three things that were really important. One was a space that I'm passionate about that I'm willing to work on for the next decade. And I think what we're working on is really that fits that bill. The other one was doing it with somebody that you feel like you can go to, you know, go work with for the next 10 years when things are tough. Uh, and so I think James and David are those people. And then the third one was, you know, are you in a place in your life where you can go on this mission? And so, yeah, luckily that's kind of where I am and where I was. So everything kind of came together and, and uh, yeah, it's been an exciting. Yeah, it's, uh, it sounds like it. Um, this Web3 space for sure is ripe with lots of inexperienced people trying to figure things out. Not sure what they want to do. <laughs> um, I've, I've talked to a lot of uh, co-founders and I think it's right for you to actually have a high bar. Um, and for sure, uh, working remotely these days and finding partners all across the world, it's it sounds nice, but I always feel like it's quite challenging um, uh, to, to just find the right partners. Um, I guess so when you start off the company uh, and, you know, it's it's been some time where, I mean, uh, I, I mentioned your recent funding. Is this your, I guess, your first round of funding that came through? Yeah, so we were fortunate enough to... Um, funded ourselves for the first right. several months and quarters. Uh, so we, we funded it for ourselves and then we, uh, yeah, we raised our pre-seed, which was the right. 2.3 that you referenced. Right. Um, so that's our- Okay. Well, that that's um, probably good practice to uh, know about. I know that a lot of founders uh, kind of go back and forth between, um, okay, should we raise through some angel, do a token sale? Um, but actually, when you put your own money where your mouth is, it actually, I feel, it makes you work a little bit harder <laughs> to make sure something happens. Um, can you share maybe some key factors that contributed to the success of like winning over investors? Because, you know, it's been a really tough year. Not saying that capital has been out there. It's just been really tight as far as who it goes to. Yeah, it was tough. I have this story where... I had 69 different calls before we got our first yes. We didn't get a lot of no's, um, but I don't think people were really deploying capital. I think a few things were happening, frankly. My pitch got better. You know, FTX had just blown up and it was in this like rolling death spiral. So that was kind of reverberating around the space. And I think actually a decent amount of VCs, A, weren't deploying, but B, had their money locked in Celsius or FTX or something like that. Yeah, it, it took a little bit of time, but I think, I think what ends up happening is you get better and just know that it is, it is a bit of a grind. You're like, okay, so this is going to be the next three to four months of my life is going to be pitching, rejection, you know, getting ghosted, whatever it is. And it's that mentality. So I've met with dozens of founders and recently some of them are just starting to understand that. And I think the ones that are saying, okay, you know what? This is fine. Money is harder than it was two years ago. And it's probably harder than it will be in two years, but we're going to, you know, grind and get it done. Those are the people I think are going to be successful because it makes you be, it makes you think uh, more strategically. It makes you a little tougher, a little thoughtful, more thoughtful about how you're cap expending the money. So for us specifically, I think we have a really good team, right? Like our backgrounds are pretty impressive. Um, I mean, obviously I'm biased, but you know, if I were to invest in a, in a, in a, in a startup at this early stage, you're investing in the people and directionally what they're trying to accomplish. Because when you're early, there's not a lot of traction, 
there's not a lot to look at, right? Like, so you're thinking, okay, I really like Arthur Lee. I really like what he's trying to work at. I think this, you know, podcast idea is a great idea. Here's the money because if he's great, he'll either make it work or he'll find something that will work. For us, it was, okay, how do we show as much traction as possible given the resources we have? And again, we were self-funded for, you know, several months. So we had a decent amount to show people. We had a pretty good team and we were able to kind of just show that we're going to get it done. And no matter what ends up happening, we're going to finish it. I think that helped. And you get one or two people to say, yes, I I like these people and I'm deploying. Here's a check. And then it starts to kind of go from there. Uh, But the first couple ones are hard for sure. Like I said, we did almost 70 and uh, no, no yeses. Okay. Well, I I know when I sp- speak to founders many times, or let's say some investors, they could bring up a number of things that they think were the key things to look at in investing in the company, uh, whether it be the product, the type of traction, if it's a token project, the tokenization or tokenomics, or then utility, uh, the community, how strong the community is, uh, and then team. And for me, I'm always saying it's all about the team. And it's not just any team, like a team of smart people. It's are you able to pull the team together and paddle in the same direction (laughs) Uh, to to, to the goal? And I think that's the the, the main thing because everything else is done by the team. You don't have uh, a a strong tokenomics. No one builds a strong community. None of that stuff happens without a strong team. So I I, I think you're right. I think you're right on there. Um, Well, did you... Uh, you know, there's a lot of these online platforms these days where you can go and meet a lot of investors or they do matchmaking. Did you try any of those? I mean, I didn't know. I'm just kind of curious if founders even use these platforms. Yeah, I'm sure somebody is using it. Uh, for us, it wasn't really something that we did. I know there's a couple of them. Uh, you know, I feel like for us specifically, I'm, you know, I'm really fortunate. I'm an LP in some funds. A lot of people that I've known from the, the Twitter and Coinbase days have gone on to become VCs or RLPs or so, you know, not everybody has the um, opportunity that I have to be able to reach out to the first five or 10 with a really warm intro and then they can kind of make intros as well. I think it all depends on where you're starting and then taking advantage of whatever opportunity you have. So for us, again, uh, it was, okay, I can get the first 10 meetings and I can talk to some friends mm-hmm. to like open up some other doors. That's, that was our strategy. And, um, yeah, so we didn't use a platform. I'm not certain how. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, well, I think for sure, when it comes to business, any type of business, uh, the strength of, uh, the capabilities or what your, or possibly the opportunities for your business is a lot of it is based on your own network. Um, and I guess when you're reaching out to, I just, you know, this gets asked to me often is like, oh, what is the best approach uh, to reach out to investor if you don't have like a warm introduction? Uh, did you do cold kind of approaches or did you like show up at events that <laughs> you, you thought that you could meet some investors or, or like, or yeah. Yeah, we did everything. So again, like nobody was deploying capital. Think of like February, March, 2023 as being like the nadir, the complete like desert. There was no water. So, you know, I did do cold outreach and actually Sean from Hustle Fund and Cheyenne, um, they were one of our first checks from a cold outreach. So that was incredible. We had cold outreach in to the company as well. When people started to see our posts and start to see excitement. So Blockchain's Founders Fund came in through um, them cold outreaching us. And yeah, so our first checks were kind of a mix of cold outreach, cold inbound, and then just, you know, getting intros. So uh, side door came in through a friend, just kind of do everything you can. Essentially what I ended up having, having was, you know, your, your Google sheet, your Excel doc, you have your Y axis with everybody that you're hitting up and your X axis with all the different information, like check size, whatever. I feel like if you can systematize it and say, okay, I'm going to go and talk to a hundred people because that's what it's going to take to get one. I feel like that's the world we're in. And I, you know, I talk to some entrepreneurs and they're saying, oh, you know, I only want to talk to the top three, whatever it is in their mind. And I said, okay, well, that's you know, <laughs> like, you're not going to get there for many reasons. So I, yeah, just have a system. It gets better over time. And just know that it's part of the game and you're probably going to be doing it, you know, multiple times. Sort of thing. Right, right. Uh, I believe I saw some article about that CEO of Canva and she had her story that she basically, I don't know if it's true, 100, you know, meetings and then the 101 
uh, is the where she got her funding, and that's just what it took persistence, especially when you're asking for money uh, in the in this time and age. Um, well, well, looking back, you said you you shifted your uh, pitch a little bit. Was that you know? Did you go out and get feedback? Like, what do you think were the biggest challenges that you faced um, that you had to maybe adjust or do do things differently? Yeah, it's a great question. I think every time you pitch, you start to learn a little bit better, or you should be anyway. So, for example, it became pretty clear to me what investors were trying to check off for their IC, their investor uh, committee, investment committee. And so, okay, can I answer all those questions so that they're not at the end of it like, oh, I don't know X or I don't know Y. So that was one thing. It's like, okay, how do I make sure I'm answering all their questions? How do I explain our team in the light that's valuable? Because there was a time, for example, things change, right? Like having X amount of engineers was a good thing. And then it became X amount of engineers was a bad thing. Tokens were good. Tokens were bad. For us, it was, okay, we're trying to build this thing that hasn't really been built before. There isn't really an analog for Web 2. There isn't really an analog for Web 3. And so trying to explain that in a sentence or two took me a bit of time. And, and now I say it and it's like, oh, okay, I get it, right? Like... You know, we're a unified API, we're a, we're a platform that sits on top of the other tools. But in hindsight, it was like back, it was harder to explain that. And then I was saying, oh, we're not, because people would, investors would invariably say, how are you going to pe- compete with these companies that have raised a billion dollars? And my answer wasn't great at the beginning. You know, it's like, well, we're going to part with them. So I think try to listen, um, try to learn, don't completely over rotate because Again, if you're meeting a hundred people for that one, if you're just kind of over rotating your pitch and your deck and your financials, your data room, then you use a lot of time up and you, you might not necessarily be any further uh, ahead. But for us specifically, it was like, okay, how do we get incrementally better? Um, and then also like, frankly, getting some thick skin, you know, like you've got VCs where I swear, Arthur, I would have bet you know, dollars to donuts that we were going to get the investment. And then you, invert, you know, you get the email, the rejection email, or worse yet, yeah, you get nothing. You know, I feel like having a bit of a thick skin is really important and just know it's part of the part of the process and having a process where you're saying, okay, here's what I do. Here's how I do it. And it actually kind of goes beyond the pitch. It's like, are you getting enough sleep? Are you taking care of yourself? Because it's like, why? You know, at the end of the day, you're like, out. You're like, man, I got 70 rejections. That's really hard for anybody. And also you've got your co-founder, your team that are counting on you. So you've got a lot of weight on your shoulders. So I guess what I would say is it's an entire process for us specifically. We got incrementally better around explaining what we're doing, you know, showing the right images and showing the product and trying different things out and seeing how it landed. Well, I met this one uh, lo- uh, local VC here in Hong Kong. And uh, one of the things he had told me before was they do invest in uh, crypto Web3 space. Um, and they were actively looking for a, a tech person, I guess, to be able to look at the code and assess whether or not you know it, it, it's good. Uh, do you feel that investors are more mature and savvy in this space or are they kind of looking at and asking questions around kind of the same stuff like they're they're more heavily knowledge around let's say web 2 they've acquired some knowledge around web 3 i mean do you think they know what they're talking about or or you know was or, or there some uh knowledge or like a, a gap in between understanding and you had to change your pitch to i guess to 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 explain it in a different manner yeah, I mean, I think in every industry, there will be people that fully understand and people that don't necessarily understand. And so I don't know if Web3 is that different than like Web2 that's that different than AI, frankly. Um, I would say that maybe in like Web2 SaaS, there's some metrics that have become hardened and you say, okay, here's the various metrics we're looking for. But even then, when you're really early and you're looking for a pre-seed investment, those metrics may or may not exist. So yeah, definitely we met, um, you know, we met investors that were more um, investing based on feeling and gut and hey, this is James, David and Kevin, they're gonna get this done. I don't fully understand how, but they're gonna do it. And then there were people that would go in and use the product as well. So I think it's a mix of all. And again, I you know, trying to understand and, and read the, the room and say like, okay, um, 
are they going to go and expect this? Are they looking for that? Uh, but I don't think there's one size fits all. There are, you know, one bit of advice that I received when I was in the muck from a, a really great friend of mine was Kevin, there's unlimited pre-seed investors out there. If you're looking for $50,000 checks, $100,000 checks, you know, there are literally millions of them. So, you know, just, it's a numbers game, keep going. So it's one thing I would tell all the listeners is that, um, you know, when you're on your 30th call and you're running out of people that you can find, just know that there are literally thousands and thousands of other VCs that you haven't tapped into. So just keep keep going. It's kind of like dating. There's, there's more fish in the season. I saw this one post, they were talking about, uh, you know, everyone's looking for Web3 developers, right? And, um, you know, then he, he gave a definition, who are Web3 developers? Well, they're Web2 developers learning what Web3 is. <laughs> So, so I guess, like you said, sometimes, you know, it's whether you call it web two or web three, it, tech is tech, right? It's just a, it's just a different uh, wrapper on, on how you want to explain it. Um, uh, I guess, uh, okay. So when we look at, um, your company in itself, um, and now that you're in, you know, we acquired this funds, how do you look at, you know, how are you going to allocate the funds? Like what, what is the, the plans now for your growth? You're saying that you're launching a new product. Yeah, so we're constantly launching new products. Today we're launching our unified contracts product. And so that is in, um, in partnership with multiple different, um, smart contract providers. And so from this particular, um, launcher, you can utilize, you know, their smart contracts and, um, it will, uh, link in with a lot of our APIs as well. So. You can utilize the APIs from, you know, Covalent, Parsec, um, Alchemy, all these great players, and they will now work with the smart contracts from other players on our, on our platform. Um, and we're, again, we're, we're building a platform and looking for really great builder tools, so developer tools. And so these are our first several products, but you know, over time, you're going to see more and more products being rolled out. So you're basically, your API set is predominantly to support the uh, EVM compatible chains? Yeah. So we started with the EVM compatible chains and we have a number of um, scan APIs that will do other chains. But the idea is that we want to roll out with, in combination with EVM, we want to roll out some other like Solana and some other ones. So I guess uh, I, I probably asked this one uh, of you when we first met, but I was just trying to, I thought it'd be good to share with the listeners. Like, uh, you know, you as a, a company, um, limited resources, how do you then pick and choose what you're going to then um, support uh, as for integration for developers? Like, what, 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 where's the... <laughs> That's a great question. And we, so um, most of my career has been in product uh, management. And, um, you know, we're, I actually, I teach product management at the university level. Um, I donate my time to help people get into space. And so a lot of it is how are we thinking about a customer discovery, customer delivery? How are we thinking about, um, product, uh, stack ranking the different features? So I think for us, there are, um, you know, various metrics and ways that we think about stack ranking and saying, okay, you know, are, are our customers asking for a smart contract uh, product? Are our con, you know, are they looking for uh, maybe an NFT partner, kind of like a simple hash or something like that? So we have a lot of different ways to do it. At the end of the day, it is stack ranking your priorities, stack ranking your um, releases. Uh, and for us, we have something called the VIB program. So very interesting builder. So by the way, if anybody's listening and they're building something really interesting, please reach out uh, because we'd love to hear from you. And the VIB program is essentially a group of um, people that are building something that we think is going to change the world potentially. And they're telling us what they need. So they'll say, hey, you know, again, we really we're really interested in figuring out some sort of spot Bitcoin price because we're doing uh, a real world asset you know, product. So they'll tell us, Hey, we need this in the next, you know, month because they're stack ranking their priorities. We'll say, great, cool. We'll roll it out and it's out before they need it. Um, think of us as like laying the track before the train comes. And so, um, that's one way of doing it is working with these VIBs to see, okay, 
for all the people in the real world asset space, what are the tools and functions they require? And so that's one way we do it, try to get as much signal from our customers, but ultimately it's uh, it's an iterative process and pretty much every day we're thinking about, are we putting our team on the right? Uh, what's been the feedback from the developer community as far as like uh, what you guys are essentially doing or is lowering the barrier uh, of entry for new new blockchain developers? Um, yeah, what were, what were people saying? Uh, what, what happened? Yeah. Yeah, people love it. You know, it's funny. I was at a, a founder meetup yesterday and you kind of, you know, do the round like, hey, what do you do? It's like, oh, I, you know, I'm uh, so-and-so at Dune. I'm so-and-so at Axlar. And I was like, hey, I'm so-and-so at Uniblock. And we're trying to build a developer, a uh, unified developer platform with all the best tools. And immediately the person's like, oh, that's cool. That would, that would save me. That would save me so much time because... So A, it's saving you a lot of time because on the initial build out, instead of getting all the different tools, making them all work together, you yeah. can use them right from us, A. Then B, um, you know, over the course of the life of your project, invariably those APIs break, they change, they evolve, new things come on. You don't need to worry about that. We're going to make, we're going to worry about that part of the, of the build. And then the last part is that, um, and also we, we can, you know, do, API key management and such so that you don't need to worry. It's like just a little bit easier for everybody. But on top of all that, um, we can offer things like load balancing and backups. So if one of the providers goes down, we automatically give you another provider. So um, this is a very novel product. There is some education that's required because nobody else is doing something like this. But when I explain it, and I've got my sentences now that are hardened over the course of like hundreds of VC calls and customer calls, People are like, oh, this is really, this is really useful. This would save me a lot of time and money. Um, so yeah, it's just a matter of, a matter of meeting people, um, either in person or, you know, via, uh, call or whatever, and then explain the story. And then people invariably tend to like it. Um, so what, I guess what's the easiest way to, I mean, I actually logged into your platform. I mean, I, I'm not a developer myself. I just wanted to see uh, what the interface looked like and everything. But what, what's the easiest way to get onboarded? Uh, the VIP program or is it just uh, you got uh, some online content or something like that? Yeah, we have everything. So we have a lot of online content that you can you know consume either on our blog. You can see it through our LinkedIn. You can see it on Twitter. Uh, our, uh, our website is there and should be able, it should be relatively self-explanatory. You just sign up, you go through the flow. It'll kind of help you kind of connect everything. And at the end of it, you should have that connection. Um, and then, but yeah, I mean, uh, this is an offer. Like if you are doing something cool, reach out to us. We're pretty active again on the tw you know, Twitter, um, Discord, LinkedIn, wherever. And, um, you know, we're happy to kind of, kind of walk you through it if you need some help. So it's already established that your platform is going to help lots of developers build faster. Where do you see the opportunities are, I guess, based on the different industries and impact that you're making? Um, you know, whether, you know, as far as like faster build or, or further in innovation, do you, are you seeing something from your customers? What are they building for? Yeah. Like what industries? Yeah. So it's funny, you know, we think of it, of developers as a leading indicator about what consumers are going to enjoy um, in the next year or two, which is really, which is really cool. So when we see what people are building, I get excited as a consumer. I think there's a couple of different themes. One of them is definitely usability. So I think we've kind of got to the point where the early adopters that are, you know, willing to put up with crappy UX have sort of kind of come on. And so there's a lot of companies and a lot of ways that people are trying to tackle the UX issues. So um, across pretty much the whole um, consumer stack, there are things that are being done. Onboarding, um, you know, identity, um, just general like key management. Um, it can be wallet management. So I think that that's one big theme is we're going to see just better products that fulfill a, a need for consumers. I think when we get to the point where we're not talking about the technology, we're talking about the benefit for consumers, that's when we start to see adoption and mass adoption. Like, oh, this just works. You know, like I want my free coffee. I don't really care if it's on blockchain, right? I and, mean, you know, or I want to, you know, give somebody a like on Reddit. I don't really care what the underlying technology is. So, 
we're getting there. I think that we're probably still, um, you know, some bit away, but a lot of what people are building right now are in the theme of, okay, how do I make this easier for people either through like UX, UI or just simplicity. So for example, access to, um, assets on chain in an easy consumable way, which is still sort of very difficult, um, or access to whatever in an easier way. You know, if you're looking, uh, I, that's probably too far ahead, uh, like five years ahead. This is, this is blockchain. Maybe I should just say two or three years ahead. Where's that spot you, do you envision the company to be at? Yeah. You know, it's funny, by the way, somebody asked me that recently. Where will you be in 10 years? <laughs> that is really, yeah. It's really far. Um, yeah, two or three years. So I think we're really fortunate to have been building in the bear market. You know, we've had a, a long time to put our heads down and build a really cool product when a lot of people were, uh, or not, were not. There's a, there's a, there's a core group of us, but now the product is ready. It's an amazing, you know, spot. People are using it. People are seeing value. Um, so I think as we see the consumer prices go up, we see the prices go up, the consumers come back, consumer developers come back. So I think probably over the next year or so, we'll just see more and more features and verticals on Uniblock. So everything that a developer might want to, to use will be there. And then, um, I think what we'll end up seeing is just a growth of the pro of the product in the company. So more verticals, more developers. Um, I think the next 18 months will be very exciting. You know, we're sitting here. December 6th, 2023, um, and Bitcoin's at 44 last time I checked, uh, you know, it was at 25, like 30 days ago. And I think, I think we're going to see an exciting 2024, uh, for builders. Uh, so yeah, my, 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 I know you asked for two years. I visited next year. I think 2024 is going to be like, What's your take on the uptick in the market uh, the past, you know, 30 plus days? What do you think it's stimulated? It, it's very cyclical and it's generally based on, well, we know it's an election year and we know generally when it's an election year in the U.S., um, usually the sitting president wants to stay uh, in power. And so they generally, you know, turn on the, the monetary and fiscal taps, the, the Fed generally has their first cut about seven to eight months after the last raise. And so that would be uh, probably in the April timeframe, we could be looking at cuts based on previous um, cycles. Uh, obviously the happening, which is, you know, clearly programmatic in Bitcoin around April as well. And everybody knows that a US Bitcoin ETF, although people don't necessarily know there's already Bitcoin ETFs in Canada, and other or jurisdictions. People don't necessarily talk about that. But anyway, uh, so my, my feeling is that, um, this is sort of normal. If you look at the, if you look at kind of the Bitcoin pricing leading up to happening and an election and everything, it generally does start to kind of take off about now. And I think that coupled with, um, you know, duration assets are becoming in vogue because we know that rates are probably peaked. We're seeing that the U.S. 10 year coming down. It was like at five and now it's at 4.2 or 4.3 this morning. So it kind of feels like a people are front running good, you know, good news from a Bitcoin ETF. B people are starting to move into long duration assets and C, I feel like it's kind of normal for what we've seen over the course of the next cycle. So. We're fortunate we got into uh, Alliance, which is kind of like the YC for Web3. They had their demo day in October uh, and we were we were well capitalized and we just said, hey, you know what? We're not going to graduate because, um, well, we're well capitalized and, you know, the market's going to be better next year. Um, so I put my money where my mouth is and I feel very strongly that the place will be in a better spot uh, in the next yeah. I mean, it's been a long winter. Lots of people have been building, excited to kind of see what kind of hits the market. But uh, sometimes, I mean, as a, a marketer in this space, I do see some of the craziness coming back, right? All those, these alt altcoins getting <laughs> hyped up again. <laughs> it just, it kind of feels like, all right, is, have we learned our lesson? Actually, uh, I was going to do this panel discussion um, 
with a bunch of people uh, that, you know, from Bloomberg and uh, maybe a, a VC fund or someone else, a market research guy, we're just going to talk about it. Like, are we really going to learn a lesson or is this the last time or the last bull run that everyone wants to take advantage of before, you know, things really change in every single jurisdiction. So we, we don't necessarily, we're human nature. I don't think, I mean, you look at the 2017 ICO boom, then you had um, the NFT boom and then you had the DeFi summer boom. Um, and I think like, you're constantly now, and we also saw the um, the futures uh, Bitcoin ETF happen at the, the previous cycle. I think, I think it's again, what's kind of booming this time? It feels like people are looking at a Bitcoin ETF and kind of going back to those those mm. those cycles and those particular narratives. So I think, like on one hand, we do learn, but we are humans, and people tend to you know kind of revert back to their tendencies um and then your, your your point about i love by the way i i love macro and i could talk about this all day but your point about uh will this be the last boom you know it's funny it's because it's it feels very obvious that this might and and as more institutions come in they generally tend to reduce the variability and the volatility so my sense is that maybe this we, we will probably continue to be cyclical but it might, the variations might start to calm down a tiny bit. <laughs> uh, previously, you were talking about, you know, yeah, okay, you, you've had so many different calls with investors and uh, the need for having thick skin. Uh, for me, what that means is actually a life lesson to anybody in this world, regardless of what you're doing. Um, but there are a lot of people that I've met who are on the sidelines watching the Web3 space and wanting to get in as an entrepreneur or founder. Um, what advice would you give to these aspiring entrepreneurs um, looking into building in the Web3 space? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it really is dependent on their situation. You know, um, if they're in a space where in a place in their life, remember I had my three things, like the thing I'm passionate about, the people I'm passionate about working on it with, and just being in a place where I'm not going to lose, you know, my house and home and I'd be able to feed myself. So, um, you know, that, that's my framework. And so if you have a framework and you're thinking, okay, like I'm ready to go become an entrepreneur, then go for it. And I would say, just know that you're going to have to work really freaking hard, right? Like if you go and work at Google, you go and work at Facebook, life is great. You know, you get paid really well. You have a really cool brand. They have great food. You're going to get paid every two weeks. Life is amazing. Um, it's a little less glamorous when, you know, you're not paying yourself a salary and, you know, you're getting told, no, your idea sucks by VCs every day or like, you know, uh, customers every day or things that are happening. So, um, I really love it, you know, to be honest with you, like there's, if I were on my deathbed and I hadn't, I hadn't tried to do another startup and, you know, had at least some modicum of, of success. That would be a big regret of mine. So I knew that I knew that I would do this. So that's kind of I'm excited to be here. Um, but I think that I think it is a matter of just be prepared to work two or three times harder at everything, and know that you're not doing like nine to five, right? You're you're doing you know whatever it is eight to twelve every day, and you're you're uh, everybody's counting on you. So I think we kind of, we romanticize it a little bit with like Shark Tank and such. Um, and just know that it's it's tough and have a thick skin and just keep pushing forward every I, I agree with you. So even me running my podcast and um, I try to pick up some projects here and there to help some clients out on uh, promoting the Web3 project. The, the fact is, if I really want to make uh, this a, a good success where I'm not just you know, localize, I really want to reach a global audience. It is around the clock. It's it in, and, and I can pay some people to do some eventually, but, uh, when you're in that build mode, it's almost nonstop. And even though if I do get some traction, I, I, I don't feel that it'll stop. I think that's the nature of the business either. You know, I mean, 
you're, you're lucky and something happens. Uh, I guess if you look at, uh, like you said, the ICO days, right? Imagine um, how many of those founders had raised money and pretty much probably lost all of it because they kept it in FTX or whoever, right? <laughs> uh, and then they were, they were leveraging it. But uh, I talked to some VC people and they're saying, oh, if I meet a founder who raised money through a token sale and they lost it pretty darn fast, they're not going to look at them again because obviously that shows their mentality of or their ability to actually build something um, because a lot of people haven't built much at all. Um, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see how, how things kind of shake out um, coming up this next year, but I'm pretty excited for it as well. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. I mean, you you know, it's a great question uh, or a great comment. You know, you are an entrepreneur, right? Like, uh, you put a lot of time in this podcast. Uh, you you know, you had to do a cold outreach through to me. You know, you had your sales call. We had our original call, and you kind of explained everything. And then you put all the time in to like do all this. Like, you know, anybody, and you're also in a completely different time zone. I think it's like pretty late. So it's about, it's about midnight, but you know. What? To your point, you know, out of uh, all the things that I had done, at least in a, my in, in this space, right? So I was a, a general manager of um, a marketing firm for for crypto. Then I was a digital asset, you know, CMO at a digital asset firm. And I was thinking about all the things that I can do. Yes, I can do it. I can manage people. I can manage projects. Then I started thinking, what is that one thing that just gets me out of bed every single morning and I just won't sleep? So I started getting bags underneath my eyes because lately I just, I'm just on overdrive. I just can't stop. Right. So I, I think that's, you know, that's, that's yeah. very important just to have that, not only the thick skin, but that uh, resiliency, you know, no matter what, it's not going to, um, yeah. it, it really is about making little progress every single day and not expecting the outcome to happen uh, fast. You know, it just takes a lot of work. Um, so your, your personal journey, uh, how do you think, um, you know, your career and where you are now, how do you think your personal journey has shaped the way you want to manage, uh, as a leader for Uniblock? You know, what, what, what type of life lessons are you bringing to, to the team? Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. I've never been asked. So I guess me personally, I, uh, I want to make sure that people are like empowered to do really great work. And so a lot of what we're doing is saying, Hey, nobody's ever done this before. And, you know, directionally, we need to get our first, whatever, thousand customers, or we need to get our first, you know, 10 um, partnerships. And how, the how sometimes isn't as obvious, but the what is what the team is kind of working on. So I think for me, it's a mix of like, um, a lot of uh, visibility so people kind of know what's going on in order to be able to make the right decisions. And then, um, you know, giving people really big lofty goals. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think for me, it's what kind of place would I thrive in and where would I want to work in? And that's the kind of place where, you know, I'm able to go in and, and make a big impact. It's another thing, like everybody here is, doing 10x the, making 10x the impact than they would at like any other company, which is great because we need it, right? Like what we're doing is hard. We have, you know, $2.3 million is not a lot, <laughs> but it's enough to get us to our next, our next like goal. And so we have, you know, we have goals, we have milestones every couple of months and everybody needs to, you know, really contribute. So that's the kind of place that I would like to work. Um, you know, so I try to create that space where, PMs or engineers or salespeople have like big lofty goals. And it's like, Hey, this is what needs to be uh, accomplished. Here's all the information that we have and um, go do it. We're about to, you know, wrapping up this podcast. So we've gone about, you know, 40, 45 minutes, but I just wanted to ask, you know, if you had any final thoughts that you'd like to share with the audience about blockchain, web three, any, uh, any, anything to share? I think I would, I would love to hear from you if you're building something interesting. Um, you know, we've got, you know, thousands of different developers on the platform building really cool things. And if you're building something interesting, please reach out. We'd love to be able to support you and, and learn from you. Uh, I think that the next uh, year is going to be very exciting. Um, 2024, I think, is going to be uh, a boom year. And actually, one thing I will say is that companies get killed in the bull market, 
not the bear market. So you see these companies that, you know, maybe raise a ton of money at the wrong valuation. They deploy it in, you know, an unsuccessful way. They get over their skis. And then assuming it's still cyclical, things, you know, get bad again. We get back into the bear market and they haven't built enough. They don't have enough money. They have too many people. So just realize that um, this space is cyclical. We're building a product. You're building a company. We're also building an industry. And this particular industry is dim different than most tech because in most tech, you really can't invest at early stage because like generally retail cannot get access to really cool early startups. But in this space, you kind of can. So you're beholden to, you know, kind of retail in a lot of ways because they can invest in the protocol layer and they can invest in tokens. Um, so just be thoughtful about the dynamics of the space and realize that, you know, in the boom times, take advantage, but don't get too far off your skis because, you know, time tells us that every, you know, every, every four years we're a boom and every two years. As I mentioned, have we learned our lesson? <laughs> I think I got to, I got to run that podcast uh, episode. All right. Uh, anyway, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, and I'm sure our audience will, you know, learn a lot from your experiences and, you know, your insights. Thank All you right. very much. Really appreciate it.
Hey, so that concludes this episode of the Startup Voyage podcast. I would like to thank all of you for listening to this episode. And I'd really appreciate it if you leave any type of comments um, that you'd like to share because it helps to feedback on how I deliver um, these podcasts. And I definitely want to improve it uh, to continue to add more value to the audience. Now, you can follow us on many of the popular podcast channels, Spotify, Amazon, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. Uh, equally, I'm going to be uploading all of these episodes onto YouTube. Uh, so it's more than just audio, it's video. You can see everyone's faces. Um, look, I really hope that you enjoyed this episode. Um, and I'm always open to new ideas or um, looking for new guests. So if you know anyone, in the space of Web3 that is an influencer or leader or someone who's really trying to shape what Web3 will be in the future, I'd love to hear from them, all right? So yeah, just comment below. Um, you can DM me. Uh, I have all my information in the details underneath this uh, podcast episode. So yeah, thank you for joining me today and have a great one. See you in the next episode.